Hey everybody, Stu Smith here going live. Going to do a little bit early today because uh, I got to leave early. Uh, but we should be able to get the whole combat swimmer stroke critique show underway along with some questions. But before we start, I want to share with you a little situation I had at the pool the other day. And it was, and it was basically a coaching lesson. So I was coaching some students on the combat swimmer stroke, and there was another person there that was a coach wanting to also help some of her students with the CSS as well. So um, I started off the explanation of the CSS a little bit differently than I would have if it was just a student, because I'm trying to also show cues as a coach to look out for um, as well. But it was very educational for the students to also hear me talking about how I coach it. So I'm going to do the same thing for this intro. So there's about six or seven points, and I put them in the description of this video so you can read that if you want to read it a little slower than I'm speaking it but it works like this the first thing you have to look at when someone's doing the combat swimmer stroke the number one cue is how they're breathing because if they're popping up to breathe that's wrong they should be turning to breathe not losing any momentum whenever they breathe they're just turning their whole body their face is out of the water but their head is not out of the water Half your face is always in the water, just like a freestyle breathe. So the way I get to that position is through the top arm pull. I'm pulling that top arm and I'm turning with the top arm. So TT, turn with the top arm. Turn your head, top arm pull, turn your head, TT. Way to remember that. Turn your head with the top arm pull. Now, that doesn't mean you're ready to breathe yet, <clears throat> but it's quick. You, I mean, you immediately go, once you're here, you immediately start pulling the bottom arm. And while your bottom arm is pulling, you are inhaling. All right. So, BB, bottom arm, breathe. Top arm, turn. Bottom arm, breathe. And that bottom arm, isn't a full stroke that comes all the way down past your waist. It is a stroke that looks more like a breaststroke. So your top arm looks more like a freestyle catch. And if you don't know what that is, you should search it. And you'll see some good videos of what the freestyle catch is. It's basically getting your arm way out in front of you and your perpendicular with the elbow down. So you're grabbing more water versus just this omnidirectional pull from your shoulder. So top arm is a freestyle catch. Your bottom arm is a breaststroke skull. And then there is a kick and a tight arm recovery and a glide. And that kick can be one of two things. It can be a scissor kick or it could be a breaststroke kick. Now, typically where this differentiates between the athlete is if one person is a land athlete and spent most of his or her life running, you probably have a better developed hip and leg dynamic to do a scissor kick, right? But if you grew up swimming or have some swimming experience, uh, you probably know how to do an effective breaststroke kick. So you can do either one, but typically the way it works, if I'm teaching a non-swimming athlete how to swim, I just default to the scissor kick. If I'm teaching a swimmer how to do the CSS, I give them an option. Because not everybody's a breaststroker, but most swimmers learned it along their journey in swimming. Um and then the glide. The glide is a really tight. Uh, body position where you're you can put your face you know tuck your chin down biceps on your ears arms are straight one hand on top of the other um, and you're gliding tight and you not only do that off the walls but you also do that 
at every kick and recovery. So you should be able to be in a tight streamlined position so your kick produces about a two to three second glide at about a yard per second pace. That's ideal or faster if you're faster. And the difference between a faster and slower glide is a more powerful kick, whether that is a faster whip kick or you're just grabbing more water and able to actually produce a faster speed. But you don't want to necessarily like spread your legs so wide that now you're you're screwing up your streamline. You want to whip kick from the knee down to really be able to make the power of pushing water behind you so you go the other way. And the extra credit part would be the breaststroke pullout because in some places it's not allowed, in some places it is, and it's not needed necessarily to be great. If you're not in great swimming shape, that breaststroke pullout's a little challenging to add to your swim because you know, you're underwater for five to seven seconds every time you turn around and kick off the wall, but it is really fast and you can actually see um, some really good uh, speed pick up off that wall to about the 10 yard mark, which if you, um, if you uh, think about it, you're, going to be really fast eight to ten yards off that wall with a good kickoff and the rest of that pool length is going to be slowly slowing down compared to that speed so your kickoffs do matter um, so you definitely want a big kickoff whether or not you do the whole breaststroke pull out or you come up and you go to your first stroke after you get a good long fast glide um, is up to you. But the key to every CSS stroke is not gliding so long that you lose momentum and you're not gliding so short that you're wasting momentum and just causing more work for yourself. So that is the difference with everything. Um, let's see. Let me get a this banner going on here. So if you do have any questions, feel free to uh, pop some on there. That is my CSS discussion from top to bottom where I typically look at things to fix along the way when I watch somebody swim 50 meters. Those are the five or six things that I look for. Every now and then I see something that's just awkward and rare. But I would say 99% of the time, everything that I comment on are, is that top arm pull, the bottom arm pull, the breathing, and the kick and glide. So, in fact, there's an article called Pull, Breathe, Kick, Glide. One Mississippi, two Mississippi, repeat. You can find that article. But if you go into the description of this video down here on, uh, on the YouTube channel or Facebook, you can see words and quotes and search those like terms I've used like freestyle catch, breaststroke skull, streamline body position, breaststroke pullout. All of those are very common swim terms that if you've never heard of them, just look them up because there are countless videos taught by swimming coaches and done by swimmers much better at swimming than I am. And you can apply some of those competitive swimming uh, events and tactics to the CSS. But first you need to learn the CSS, then you can start fine tuning it with a better pull, a better kick, a better streamline, all those things. So, all right. Um, Morning, Stu and Buzz, do they care about sharking during the pool swims or ocean swims? Not so much. Um, you can see old Bud's pictures uh, where guys are doing ocean swims and you see that big high elbow coming out of the water. But prior to it, they will call you on it because probably the only rule 
to the CSS, if you really think about it, or the only rule to the Navy PST swim is it needs to be an underwater recovery stroke. That's the primary rule. Otherwise, it's disqualifying. So if you have an arm coming out of the water, if you're doing a freestyle recovery, that is completely disqualifying. So over the years, it has kind of evolved from, you know, the underwater recovery stroke. People high elbow it and do the recovery as long as their hand stays in the water. It's an underwater recovery stroke. That's kind of uh, vague, if you ask me, a little bit. I don't see it as an underwater recovery stroke if your elbow is coming up out of the water. But if it's going underwater, it's an underwater recovery stroke. I mean, that's why the elementary side stroke and the breaststroke are also legal uh, underwater recovery strokes to do for the PST. But yeah, it's the thing about it, if you do this and let's say they yell at you for doing it, it's a real easy fix. It's literally going from this to this, and it doesn't make a big difference. Um, let me show you some uh, videos. In fact, you guys might like this. Uh, because I've shared it a few times, but I just want to share it again because this is a um, this is me swimming, and this is how I teach it the way I do it. All right, so. Let's see if I can uh, get this. Let me uh, hide my word here. You know what? I'm going to have to do something. What the heck? All right, let me do this. Something happened to my screen and I can't. All right, here we go. Let's do this. Sorry, I couldn't find my uh, play button because it was... Uh, There we go. All right. So once again, this is me swimming and let's break it down from top to bottom. I'm just going to let this thing just play out. So you kick off the wall, streamline. I do a little dolphin kick, double arm pull, heads down. I look up just a little bit, make sure I'm going straight, but you don't really have to do that. I would say if I were coaching myself, I would say keep your head down, right? And that means no need to look forward as much. Let's just Keep your head looking down, right? So top arm, bottom arm, kick and glide. Notice that bottom arm doesn't go all the way to my waist like my top arm does. It's a breaststroke skull, and it links up with the uh, it links up with the top arm on that recovery. So top arm turn, bottom arm breathe. Notice that top arm turn, bottom arm breathe. Kick, hold the glide. Yeah. So let's hold the glide for one Mississippi, two Mississippi, pull. There you go. So one more time. Coming down, head down, top arm, bottom arm, kick. One Mississippi, two Mississippi, pull. One Mississippi, two Mississippi, pull. There you go. So smooth, like butter. So that is me doing it. That's how I've been doing it for years. Um. Is it the only way to do it? No, you could do it multiple ways. That is just my way of doing it and it works. Now I could also show you another guy's way that is just a little bit different. In fact, I think I showed you uh, last week how he had a more of a glide here, but he was really fast. He was faster than I was actually. Um, in fact, I'll try to show you the difference here real quick. Let me see where he is. I posted this last week, and I know we went through it last week, but let me see exactly what I did to it. So it's right here. No, that's with fins. Let's see if this is it. No. That's all right. It's up on, I think this is it right here. Yep. Ah, damn it. It's with fins again. <laughs> So I had two of them. I had one without fins, one with fins with him, and he was uh, he was pretty good. 
All right, so let me just go with what I had planned. I'll, if I find it, we'll we'll talk about it. All right, so let me share this one again. I um, don't see any questions, so we'll just keep on doing the videos. All right, so here we go. Let's start off from the top here. Kick off the wall, does decent. Notice, now notice what did he not do? He did not do a breaststroke pullout, right? So he goes right into the stroke, and this is fine. So this is about a 52-second swim. So top arm, bottom arm kick, one Mississippi, two Mississippi, three Mississippi, four. Like, one Mississippi, two Mississippi, three. Yeah, if I'm able to say that third Mississippi, almost four, I think he's overgliding. So what I would do for him is say, hey, Let's try to pull on three, not overglide to a point where you lose all your momentum. But also look at his streamline position. Look at this right here. Look at his hands. Like they're all over the place. They're actually like this, right? That is not streamlined at all. It should be one on top of the other. You know, lock that thumb out on top of it so it is perfectly flat. Not sure why he's doing that. Top arm, bottom arm, kick. And that top arm could be more of a breaststroke, I'm sorry, a freestyle catch as well. But he's got a good kick. He just needs a tighter streamline. He'd probably glide a little longer with it. So not too bad. All right, another question here. Hey, if you're ready to make it through buds, do you recommend going straight to dive motivator to the PST as opposed to doing the workouts with the nsw scouts um you know not all recruiting districts have workouts with the nsw scouts so my advice if you're ready you should start the enlistment process I, and when i say ready ready to crush that pst so you take the pst because you practiced it you're crushing it now let's go test it for real and see where you are um you know, along with the, um, along with one of the dive motivators or NSW scouts, doesn't really matter. My advice is, if you're ready to crush it, take the test. You may not need to go do the NSW scout workout unless they it's required. Not all recruiting districts have extra workouts around their PSTs. Like most times your recruiter and scout team will only be able to see you once every two weeks to take a PST. That's just the way it works. They may, they may bounce around from one end of the recruiting district to the other, given PSTs throughout the week. Um, you can either follow them and do another one in a week or whatever, if you need to, but that makes no sense. So, um, it's it's not universal on how to do that. So my advice to you, you're ready to crush the PST, go to the recruiter, start the recruiting process, go to MEPS, get cleared for all that stuff, take your PST, and then crush the PST. You have nothing else to do other than pick your ship date. And then between that time and your ship date, sure, jump on some NSW scout workouts. Can't can't hurt you. Treat them like a warm up for your regular workout. <sighs> hey Stu, I started swimming the CSS three months ago. Currently, five hundred is seventeen minutes. Woo! Feel like I don't have enough lung capacity. Any tips? Yeah, you're out, not in swimming shape, and you're probably not swimming the CSS properly. So if you're, you need to take a video, have somebody take a video of you swimming 50 meters and then compare it to any of these that I just showed you. It doesn't look like that. You're doing it wrong. But yeah, it, it is. If you're swimming that slow, it is two things that are wrong. Your technique to swim it is not right and you're not in swimming shape. Like if you get your swimming, if you just get your technique right, you should be able to get a 12 minute. You know, even with 
having to hold on to the wall to catch your breath every 50 meters. So there's something else wrong. Or you, you just recovered from pneumonia or something and have no lungs. I, I don't know. Just keep swimming. Keep running. Work on your aerobic base with other activities. So the kick should be a big one or something medium with a powerful push. Um, it should not be a wide kick. Like the wider kick you make, it's like putting on the brakes for a second and then kicking, right? You don't get a lot of power from your hips down. You get all your power from, yes, it starts in your hips, but it also whips and multiplies from your knees down. So it doesn't have to be huge. Like when you see a really good breaststroker, and you can Google this, um, you'll notice that that breaststroke kick, is not way out here kicking out wide it is it is knees in whip kicking those feet from the knees down whipping the water and that makes a powerful breaststroke kick it's not an open like you're doing the splits and closing them a good question good question let's do another one all right here we go So we have a guy swimming here. So let's uh, see what's going on. Kick off the wall. No, uh, no breaststroke pull out on this one. So notice top arm pull, turn with the top arm. He does that. Does the bottom arm breathe? Top arm turn, bottom arm breathe. Kick, pull the glide. Not bad. And even notice he's exhaling while he's gliding on in the glide position. This isn't horrible. I would say it is a it's a 53 second 50. So he's just under sub nine on this pace. So I think it could be a little faster, but it's not bad. And it, if you can get sub nine on it, I mean, that's sufficient. You, know, you don't have to be sub eight. Seven minutes on these 500 yard swims. As long, I think, as long as you're under 9:30, I personally like to be under nine, closer to eight. But you don't have to be. What really matters is you can pass this test any day with a nine minute swim, and you can put on a pair of fins, go for two miles, and crush that thing well under the minimum standards at Muds, which is the weekly swim test. Two mile swims with fins every week. You need to be able to do that under 75 minutes for third phase minimum standard. For first phase minimum standards, under 85 minutes. But my advice is go in there, swim in sub 70, and you'll have a nice little win, a victory of the day. Get to dry off early, eat, hydrate, get ready while people are failing to swim, get beat down, and you got like 20 minutes to watch people get gooned and you're sitting on the drying cages, eating an apple and hydrating, ready for the next event. So that's where it pays to be a winner, for sure. Let me see, what have I shown here? I'm showing this is my third one, right? Might show another one. Yeah, this is one. Yeah, this is one. Oh, yeah, okay. So this one. I'm going to show you here in a minute. Let me take this question. Let's see. Can you guys hear me? Let me see. Sorry about that. Looks like somebody said my mic was uh, out. Test, test. Ah, oh, you guys can hear me. Okay. Here's a good one. So, all right. Let's go, considering how often you get wet, how many pairs of socks and underwear are good to take to buds? And do you get any time to change them during the day? Is it worth doing? Um, yeah, you know what? You really don't wear underwear under those camis. You're going to wear your UDT shorts under them. I wouldn't wear cotton shorts under them. That's just going to be a breeding zone for you to get funky stuff down there so the udt shorts 
underneath your camis that I recommend. Um, and they, they're kind of a canvas, you know, they, they dry off real fast. Um, my advice for the shoes and feet being wet, that's a tough one. Yes, you can change socks at some point if you want to, maybe during lunch. Not a bad idea. You're probably going to get wet again pretty soon. Uh, my advice would be if you know you're going to get wet in the next event, probably don't even worry about it. But if there's a chance where you might be spending an hour in a classroom learning something, yeah, sure, change your socks. See if you can uh, see if you can have some dry feet for a while. Um, the boots dry fairly quickly, and the the Nike SFBs, the tongue, for some reason, um, the part that's on the front of your foot stays wet longer than the old canvas boots like the Bates and the Vietnam era jump boots. So um, that's an issue uh, for some people. But it's never a bad idea to have a dry pair of socks in your locker, right? And if you can put them on, put them on. Um, you just know that they're probably going to get wet for sure. Good question, though. All right, I got another video to show you guys. Let me see what we got here. Um, all right, so let me show you this from the beginning. So notice what happens here. He kicks off the wall, and like, as soon as he kicks off, he starts this little dolphin kick. Don't do that. Like, I'd rather you just kick off the wall and stay straight like a pencil. Don't do not do that dolphin kick, all right? Because that dolphin kick just really just slows you down when you could just be doing an effortless glide. You can see what happens. As soon as he does that, like, he just lost all his momentum going into the throw. So my advice for him would be kick off the wall and don't do – the breaststroke pull out, just stay streamlined as long as you can. You feel yourself slowing down, come up for that first stroke, turn to breathe. Because that's probably going to get you one, two, like you see those little lane lines there? It'll get you to the third lane line, you know, where you're coming up right now. And if you transition well from the, the glide into the first stroke versus – doing the underwater pull out and then kicking and recovering underwater. That's where a lot of people lose momentum if they're not used to doing the breaststroke pull out. So just skip the breaststroke pull out and go right into that top arm pull. If you notice it's making you lose momentum. And if you notice, look what happened. Whenever he does that pull out and turn, like he just, he just stopped in the water. Now he's got to recreate all of that momentum every, you know, with every stroke. So he's got a top arm, bottom arm, kick, one Mississippi, two Mississippi pull. My thing right here for him, I think is his kick is a little weak because it is a little slow. It's a 20-yard pull, and I think he does a lap in like 47 seconds, which isn't horrible, but you want to be closer to 40 seconds. So top arm, bottom arm, kick, pull that glide. Yeah, if you notice after he kicks, it just doesn't really go anywhere. So his kick is what we need to work on. So, in fact, let me just show you. We'll show you kind of a comparison here to kicking and actually moving with that kick. See that? So top arm, bottom arm, kick. See, I'm still moving for a couple of seconds. One Mississippi, two Mississippi, pull. And even when I pull, I'm still moving. I haven't lost any momentum. Same way for this uh, breaststroke pullout. When you do that transition and you go into the stroke, there's no loss of momentum on that. Like I didn't stop in the water. So you don't want to stop in the water, whether you're popping up to breathe, because that will stop all horizontal movement and you create this vertical movement in the middle so you stop moving horizontally so my advice is 
get good at that breaststroke pullout. And if it's not comfortable for you, skip it. As long as you're keeping momentum, you're going to be faster than if you add it to your, um, if you're going to add it to your day of swimming. Huh, well, that's fun. Any other questions? So any any comments on the teaching part of this? Because I did see when I was coach, I was coaching about 20, 25 people on the CSS along with the swimming coach. And I noticed as I was uh, coaching this large group, basically in generalities at first, and then I got pretty heavy in specifics, but a lot of people picked it up quickly after I went through those five or six items, turn to breathe, bottom arm pull, during you breathe during your bottom arm pull, kick and glide, hold that streamline glide for three Mississippis, and um, repeat, pull, breathe, kick, glide, repeat. In fact, there's an article on that. I'm sure you guys have seen it if you've stuck around a while or if you're new here. Here's a great article on the uh, on the topic as well. So it's just called Pull, Breathe, Kick, Glide. That's the title of the article. So check that out. Let's see. Any other questions? Had a few questions today. Not as many as we normally do. That's all right. I'll give you a couple more minutes to come up with a question. Then I'm... Uh, I may cut it short. This thing runs on questions. Actually, this show runs on questions and likes. So give me a question. Hit the like button. And everybody's happy. Because I'll give you an answer. Until I run out of time. Okay, cool. Coaching helped me perfect mine, so there you go. Any advice on how to prepare for pool comp with mask pulling off, i.e. is it worth blowing out your goggles to try to get your tubes fixed or get good enough to basically do it blind? Um, no. Yeah, you're, you're going to do 99% of pool comp is without a mask. If you find your mask somewhere, in the process, let, let's say, okay, he comes down, he rips off your mask. He, I mean, you're going to lose your fins. You're going to lose everything. Um, and it's just your job to just crawl, right? And he's going to tie your, turn off your air. You have to turn it on. You know, if you can turn it on while he's going up for breath and then, you know, before he comes back down, you see your mask there and you want to clear it. Sure. Clear it might give you a second or two of clarity. Um, but I will tell you this. I didn't. I, I don't think I found my mask um, during that whole event until the very end when I had to store everything up and put it back. <sighs> yeah. So, yeah, my advice would be to uh do something we call the ditch and dawn, all right? And what that means is you have a mask, a snorkel, and a pair of fins, right? And you're on the surface breathing through your snorkel. You go down to the bottom, and you take off your fins, you take off your snorkel, you take off your mask, and you store everything around each other. So put the snorkel in the fin foot, put the mask around the fins, set it on the bottom, come up to the top, catch your breath, take a couple breaths, go back down and put it on. And the way you put it on is you put your mask on first, clear it, put your um, fins and snorkel on, come back up, blow your snorkel and start in inhaling, exhaling through your snorkel. That's a good way to get comfortable in the water when you're having to do things on a short breath hold and these by the way it takes 15 to 16 seconds to ditch come back up 
15 seconds, catch your breath, go back down. And it takes anywhere from 18 to 22 seconds to dawn all your gear. Um, so it's not like you're doing a minute breath hold under there, but I wouldn't do it alone regardless. So just make sure your lifeguard or your buddy is watching you. Usually we do this with two people. One person's watching, giving hand signals because there, there is a series of hand signals that you have to also do for this test that we do here at the Academy. Um, it's basically, um, the instructor give you a one, um, you give them a two, that means you go down, you go down, take everything off, stow it, you give them a three or an okay sign, they, they look at everything, they give you a four, that means come up to the surface, and, uh, with your hand over your head, you do it like this, just to protect your head when you're surfacing, and then, you um, you take a couple breaths and you go back down and do it again. And once you got it on, you give the okay sign. The instructor give you the four. That means come up to the surface. You come up and you're done. So there you go. Um, it is is taking longer than I thought because I am adding new exercises that I haven't done previously for other books so you know other books have exercises like you know flutter kicks and leg levers and you know sit-ups and stuff like that i'm doing a whole different core section for the 50 and over um gonna be you know more farmer walks and um knee ups and just a variety of type of uh core exercises versus just laying down and doing a lot of crunches. So let's see. Two, I think you are not sure what this is. So DeSalle and others. I'm five, oh, 4'11, 130 pounds. Went from 1430 to 904. Nice. Two and a half months, 50 50 tie five times a week. That works. And you don't have to be tall to be a fast swimmer. That's a myth. Now, are faster swimmers taller? Sure. But, you know, a 904 for a 411, that's awesome. Do it in intervals at first, but put out, be tired at the end of it. <laughs> there you go. That's awesome. Nice work. Uh, any tips for increasing push-up number? Yes. Um, I got a lot of tips for push-ups. Do push-ups, but do them smart. You can you can do them one of two ways. You can do them every other day in a smart program. Like, uh, in fact, I have three favorite exercises or workouts to crush PT tests. I want you to read this article. You do them three days a week. One of them each day. The other way... Uh, the other way is to do the uh, two-week protocol, which is a 10-day push-up, pull-up, or sit-up routine that you can follow in this link and see what happens. So give that a shot. I've seen people increase 25 to 50% of their push-ups and pull-ups in a two-week cycle. It's 10 days of straight push-ups followed by three days of rest and test on day 14. So read both those articles and um, yeah, get pushing. Any tips for making your wife understand you in this spec ops journey? Um, no, I can, uh, I can't, I was lucky. And um, I was very lucky to find one that, you know, didn't know a whole lot about the Navy. So first of all, she, she was a girlfriend at the time. And I didn't know a lot about the Navy. I just went four years of Naval Academy, knew a little bit, but I didn't know what the next step was, right? So 
she actually we actually just dated for four years uh yeah almost four years before we got married and during those four years i went through buds i went through sqt got my trident deployed some and um then got married so she knew exactly what she was going to be getting into at that point um doing it from a married standpoint starting that's that's a tough one right you're both are going to learn about the community together and as long as you're just honest with her um keep her abreast of all those details i think that is the thing that you know be a realist right don't be overly optimistic i think in some looking back i was probably overly optimistic on some things and then a little bit disappointed that things didn't work out that way versus uh just be a realist about it and say here's here's the way it looks and then if it if it's better it's better if it's not you expected it so not necessarily pessimist but somewhere in the middle uh tom asked what does one's ready mean i googled it and don't understand the explanation one's ready is a podcast so google one's ready podcast in fact the youtube page is called one's ready <laughs> so i don't know what google machine you're using but look at this i just put a link in there and it is the one's ready youtube page so check that out one's ready.com come on tom I don't know how I don't know I don't know how much easier that could be. <clears throat> All right. Is naval SEAL survival training similar to other branches of the military? Um it's a little different. Uh we go through with the pilots as well. Um but it's similar. I mean, I think they all have the same POW training. Um you know, I'm assuming you're talking about SEER school, S-E-R-E, -E, survival, evasion, resistance, escape. They are similar. Some are a little bit different. Some are a little longer, but they are similar. Yes. Oh, you mean, what does the term mean? Why do they call the podcast that? Um, you know, I, I think it's. When you have a group of people working out, sometimes there are groups of one, two, and three, right? Let's say you have three groups of 10, right? That first group's called ones, second group's called twos, third group called threes. One's ready. Boom, you jump in and you go do your thing. Two's ready. Jump in, do your thing. Three's ready. That's how I use it. Now, how the Air Force uses it could be a little different, but I have a feeling that's probably where that came from sorry misunderstood you <clears throat> but i don't know maybe, maybe you can find it on the ones i i don't know they got enough shirts with the ones ready on it so it means something <laughs> you can always ask them go to their instagram page and just ask them, what does one's ready mean? They're, they're nice guys over there. I was on their podcast. Um, it was a lot of fun. I, I would go check them out, especially if you're thinking about Air Force Special Warfare. Or you want to learn a little more about it. Hey, Stu, what is the max days you train per week if I sleep and diet are on point? Um, I train six days a week, and I'm old. Um, and some of those are two a days. So, um, Monday, Tuesday, and sometimes Thursdays are two a day workouts. So now one of those days is a mobility day and it's an easy day full of non-impact cardio and stretching and foam rolling and all that. So one of those, but following that is a good swim workout. So it's treading and swimming and drown proofing and all that. So it's more of a skills day. So that counts as one of my days and it's, I feel great after it. So it's kind of a, 
I call it kind of an active rest, but you're focusing on uh, mobility and technique stuff and flexibility. But the other five days are pretty hard, and three of those days are two workouts. So I guess I get eight workouts plus a mobility day and a day off. So that's very doable. Now, I will tell you this. My wife will look at me sometimes and say, you're overtraining. I can see it in your eyes. I don't know how she does that, but. I made the mistake once and gave her a whole list of overtraining symptoms. And now she tells me when I am. So that's not a mistake. You should, you should let someone who sees you every day have that list just because you won't see it. And I've been doing this for a long time and I'm not an expert at diagnosing when I am overtraining myself because I just kind of, gut check it and go do it when I could probably pull back a little bit and not feel like crap and fall asleep at seven o'clock at night. <clears throat> Does the underwater knot tying only begin to be tested during second phase? Nope. First phase. Phase test. And it's done after hell week, I think. No, it's done before hell week. Hell, I don't know. We did it before Hell Week when I was there. I, th I know they do. No, you know what? I take it back. They do. They do it before Hell Week, and they do treading and life saving after Hell Week. <clears throat> there you go. All right. Did I miss any questions? I think. We got it. Yep, I think I got all the questions done. All right, folks, so I appreciate your time. I will be back next week. Um, check out stewsmithfitness.com. Use the Live15 coupon code, say 15%. You know, this is like, thank you for sticking around. If you want any programming over there, say 15%. So, let me know. Um, let me know if I can help you. If you come up with a question, you can always email me, Stu at StuSmith.com. So until next week, my friends, I will see you later. Have a good one.